All set. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, welcome, folks. Thanks for taking time this morning to, to participate in this um, meeting. This is the subcommittee um, for funding as part of the overall ADV Van and Derrick -like Vessel Work Group. Um, I'm co facilitating this with Katie Register. Uh, I am a coastal planner with the Virginia Coast Zone Management Program, and Katie's the executive director of Clean Virginia Waterways uh, at Longwood University. So uh, I see some familiar faces here. Um, just a real quick overview. Um, we had a meeting. Uh, the, the most recent meeting was the policy subcommittee this past Friday. Um, we we're gearing up to have a meeting in May, uh, I believe May 20th, for the overall work group meeting. So I um, expect a larger group, but we've had a great number of faithful and dedicated folks um, participate in all of these subcommittees. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Jessica Steelman, who is um, with Accomac Northampton PDC. She is the chair of the uh, Prevention and Public uh, Education Subcommittee. So great to have you here, Jessica. Um, and thanks again, Neil, for all your support and attendance through all these meetings. Um, Jesse uh, is here with the Virginia Coastal Policy Center with William Mary Law School. Uh, he and Anthony Cazado are working on a white paper um, that will have policy recommendations. So Hopefully with this meeting, we'll try to build upon the efforts uh, on last Friday's policy meeting, focusing mostly on the fee and funding structures. We had a couple of exhibits to share with you all today. Um, and then I wanna welcome um, Alexander Leatherman as a new face here. If you wanna unmute yourself and say hi and, and say your affiliation, um, welcome again. Hey, good morning. This is uh, uh, MSD3 or Petty Officer Leatherman from uh, United States Coast Guard Sector Virginia Marine Environmental Response. Uh, just tuning in to see what this is all about. I'm new to the to this uh, subcommittee. Uh, have been working with some legacy underwater threat projects, uh, specifically the NOAA Roulette program at our unit. So uh, just a tie in to, uh, to this subcommittee. Um, seeing what's all about. Thank you for having me. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Alex, can I ask you to please put your contact information and um, title uh, in the chat box so that we can get that on our list of um, participants, please? Roger that. I will try. I'm working off a cell phone, but I will do my best. <laughs> okay. Or you could send an email if that's better. My email address is registerkm. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's spelled <clears throat> R-E-G. I S T E R K M as in Mary at longwood.edu. Either way is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So I will um, go over, um, I'm going to actually stop sharing this agenda and go back to a summary of um, our uh, interviews with other states. Um, I've listed them in uh, chronological order and have highlighted. Um, the funding aspects and those ideas. Uh, as some of you may recall, in a previous meeting, um, you all sort of vetted some of these questions that we were going to um, consult other states with to kind of get an apples to apples comparison on, on multiple fronts, um, touching on uh, several of the subcommittees' um, efforts. So I'm going to share again. Um, here we go. Is everyone seeing a document with some highlights in it? Highlights from interviews with other states? Literally highlighted? Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we got one person coming in, Katie. You keep tabs on folks coming in. Uh, oh, Anthony's here. I'll admit it right now. So as you all know, um, Anthony Sato is with the Coastal Policy Center and is a student at William Mary Law um, School. So he's working on that white paper I, I mentioned a second ago. Um, welcome, Anthony. Thanks for making it. Um, so this really, I, I went through this relatively quickly, uh, still took up a little chunk of time to give the overall in-depth um, uh, framework, but the, the key take-home uh, take message is that all these states are different. Uh, that's the point of, of having these interviews, um, to understand kind of their funding sources, their mechanisms, um, the political climate for a tax or a fee, um, issues with the um, fee with the Coast Guard grant. Um, to the boating state uh, boating agencies um, to look at uh, lessons learned uh, to try not to reinvent the wheel that sort of thing um, and there are some particular mechanisms that in the next stage of the agenda we're going to try to hone in on and get this committee's um, thoughts on just the feasibility the model the structure and then um, get the, the update in the white paper from anthony um, you know just to kind of have the lawyers vet you know some of these ideas and whether this require regulatory agency change or 
um, draft new legislation and that sort of thing. So, um, and then Katie will get into sort of a, a mock uh, budget um, with some of the uh, hypothetical fees, the funding that would generate, um, and then whether we wanna staff a full-time position um, at one of the state agencies in Virginia um, and, and those sort, sorts of things. So that's sort of keep that in the back of your head as I'm going through this list. So um, before I actually started with this um, project, Katie had, um, was able to interview folks from California in August of 2020, um, and they've been interesting. And, and Katie can can chime in here a little bit because uh, I only have a couple of bullet points. But you know, they make a, an important uh, distinction between recreational and commercial. Uh, as we've learned from previous meetings, commercial vessels tend to be a little bit bigger, uh, therefore harder to remove, um, and that would eat up a chunk of our funding if we were to have a dedicated fund. Um, either through the General Assembly or through a fee structure. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we, you know, the point of these subcommittees um, are to really get, you know, identify hurdles early and often before we propose a white paper or report and then people say, hey, you know, we didn't think of this. Um, so any crit criticism is, is definitely welcome. Um, you know, voluntary turn-in programs, that's more of a policy thing, but that's again, something in the back of your head, think about perverse incentives. Is the state funding this? If I pay into a fee, then I can just turn in my boat, no problem. Um, so we want to avoid that, that sort of lack of accountability. Um, this is one specific thing in California about a gas uh, tax and a registration fee. So, you know, the, there's different political climates, different states, obviously. Um, Florida is another one we'll talk to um, later. You know, they were very anti-tax, but they got funding um, through other sources from the, their state legislature. And a lot of that has to do with hurricane-based um, um, ADVs, um, so vessels that are displaced in a storm. So uh, yes, that is, is also a problem. Here, go ahead, Katie. Yeah, two comments about the California uh, summary. Uh, the voluntary turn-in program that they have in California, they say that a old boat that's turned in, that's still floating, uh, turned into one of the marinas that have a contractual relationship with the state. Uh, it costs um, a third to a fourth as much money when someone shows up with the title and they say, I'm surrendering my boat, as opposed to if that boat became abandoned and had, you know, they had to do the title search, they had to find the owner, they had to get it out. And if it sunk, of course, it would be way more expensive. Um, and also the gas tax, as I understand it, they have estimated how many gallons of gas are sold for recreational boaters in the state. And then that percentage of the California gas tax goes into their program. So it's just, as I understand it, it's an estimate. It's not like only the gas sold at marinas. Um, so just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Yes, thanks, Katie. And that brings up another um, quick couple of points. Again, just this bigger context as you, as you follow, you know, um, the findings here, even the back of your head, who is bearing this cost? It's come up before. Um, we are, you know, with working to do a statewide ADB program. So that includes freshwater bodies like Smith Manor Lake with, with Neil here, like Anna, that sort of thing. Other states were strictly coastal or had no ADB issue to their knowledge that were inland water bodies. And one like Rhode Island said, we might have some inland ponds, but certainly no lakes. So it definitely geographically um, and politically, there are, there are some differences. Uh, so it is a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison at times. Um, another thing to think of, you know, beyond the user fee um, is, you know, sort of it, the opportunity cost of time. Um, none of us, to, to my knowledge, are, are economists. So you, that's a, a term where, you know, it's, it's can you put this burden on existing state staff? Um, do, you, do you reach a certain threshold in which you need to have a full-time position to do all this? Um, and then we'll get into later about levels of government and that um, ability of partnerships. And then to Katie's point about the one fourth the cost, um, that's really important um, when you think of economies of scale. So you might have, I think we can all agree that a hazardous event, you know, hazards to navigation, public safety, leaking fuel into the environment, that's probably one we want to remove first. But there are, you know, if something's listing in a marina versus there might be, um, you know, something that's sort of outside the channel you know, and, and sort of, you know, marsh, I mean, where we're going to get into the criteria later as we develop this and, and our vessel inventory becomes more robust, but think about, you know, what do we want to go where the money is the farthest after identifying those emergency needs for removal and how do we structure that and how do we tell someone, you know, you know, this one really isn't as high on the list because we can get better bang for a buck through a, a at-risk vessel turn-in program. So those are some questions that kind of uh, noodle on. 
Um, this was a, another early one, and, and some of you may have attended the March 3rd overall work group meeting uh, where we had Dorothy Deal from Oregon State Marine Board give a, a very detailed uh, presentation um, and, you know, with some of the costs and the range of those and why the, the costs um, were that way, and then also their process with the state prioritizing these vessels, working local law enforcement, and ultimately paying um, through a dedicated fund, not that much as you can see here, about 150 k a year, but they have already got the priorities and they're just chipping away at the list and they're hiring the contractor directly. So state would have some of the liability um, and and then you know you, you have the contractor who's already pre-bedded on a list. So um, that was really it from, from those things. But another theme you'll see here is uh, how to not avoid a Coast Guard, an uh, issue with the Coast Guard grant to the state voting administrator, but how to work with um, the Coast Guard um, to, to clarify so that they can dot their I's, cross their T's um, through their um, overall budget, um, you know, oversight to just make sure that, you know, you can structure a fee in a way that is not conflicting with the grant requirements, which prohibit it based on, on how you, what you call it um, and where that fund goes. Um, so we've had some success stories. We've had some folks that have, have run into a little bit of trouble there. And we do want to let you all know that um, we're going to have a meeting with um, some NOAA staff from their Marine Debris program to who have been very helpful and gracious in, in providing some resources of side-by-side um, -side comparisons, um, you know, contacts for other states. And we want to get a better idea of, you know, what is that process? What is the tripwire? What is, um, what, how do you, how can we navigate that um, if a additional fee for voter registration was proposed to be um, the best way to, to raise money? Uh, sort of a user payment that isn't a tax on all uh, residents of the Commonwealth. Um, so we want to kind of get that clarification, but that's the next step. Um, going, uh, just a quick note here, it's not really highlighted, but we, we did have two separate interviews with South Carolina staff. One was more the equivalent of, of my boss with the uh, program manager with their Coastal Zone Management Program that primar primarily focuses on policy and is funded by NOAA. So what they've done, um, it's not as much boots on the ground as you'll see in the second interview lower, but they have um, basically set aside to, in their grant, um, cycle to NOAA to say, we'd like to have some funds to develop a pilot program, um, in our toolkit, best practices, and inventory, um, and some data collection. And at the end of five years, it, it, the carrot is that it's match free. At the end of that period, the stick is basically, you better have an enforceable policy that comes out of that. So it doesn't have to result in one every year. Um, we currently haven't structured our marine debris reduction plan to specify that outcome, but we are working with Katie to develop, to update our, our Virginia Marine Day Review Reduction Plan. And this is an element of that. Um, so that's just another uh, sort of soft money source uh, to fund a program. Um, and then I guess I'll skip to the, the state with South Carolina. Um, we talked to a gentleman who was more on the law enforcement side and they have a system where this is where you, the first um, of these interviews, you start to see a partnership with um, local governments. Um, and that's where the state um, or that local government, um, they will go and they go to the uh, last identified owner after doing the same homework and titling process that we've heard for, uh, from before, tracking down the last owner. And they will basically pretty please um, ask them to sign over that vessel. And then the state or the locality with their Department of Public Works will handle the removal, uh, crush the vessel and take it to a landfill. Um, so they are not scared at all about any liability. That's something, again, to think about, um, you know, talking about how BMRC, um, you know, has the authority to remove these vessels, but no funding. And yet DWR um, it has been hesitant to, um, other than to reach out to, to some towers and to escort them um, and the vessel to the shore and then process it from there. So we want to think about um, what, what is the comfort zone for these agencies and certainly funding, I think, could a long way to, to improving uh, their capacity to, to tackle the issue. Um, but it is very interesting to note with South Carolina that they, um, you know, really push, they have some money, um, some general funding, um, but most of the time it is the locality that is prioritizing removal and they are working with the state to get that title transferred and then they work with it um, through existing public works staff. So they're not, um, there wasn't really a big slew of hiring. It just was something that was absorbed into their um, daily um, daily duties, and I think they also have first right of refusal. Correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, to um, salvage some vessels that are, have some value, um, and that money would then be able to um, be used by the locality. So that's an interesting departure from 
um, the state top-down model. Um, and, and then to go back up, Florida is, is similar in that they work with local governments. Um, they basically have a grant um, or a reimbursement program um, in addition to some, some monies from, from hurricane um, vessel removal um, and then from their uh, from other sources in their, gen their general assembly. So they haven't raised taxes to create a separate fund. They've just been able to draw uh, money to their program. Um, and they've basically, they've got a huge list of vessels, a huge backlog, mostly because of the recent hurricanes and past years. Um, but what they do is they basically let the localities first come first serve, um, put in an application uh, or, or re uh, they have to front the cost, but then they will apply to the state for um, the reimbursement costs, which is strictly the cost of removal. Um, they don't allow for any staff overtime and sometimes they'll push back and, and reject the application or modify it so that they will only fund that actual removal. Um, so, and, and another process to think about, um, and this is also kind of straddles the policy committee and the removal um, subcommittee is that, you know, think about a rapid emergency uh, streamlined paperwork process um, that, that knocks a couple of days or weeks off of, off of normal application. Um, so you have to have the authority, a letter from the state to do any removal as a locality, but you can expedite that. Um, one thing to note on the economy of scale is that usually rapid emergencies for that one vessel that's really stuck in the channel and someone's gonna hit it boating the next day. Um, but with the, the bulk grant that allows for a little more um, bulk, um, as, as it suggests, multiple vessels kind of packaged together to kind of get that economy of scale. So it's all a timing thing. And it's, it's how do you have your ducks in the row? Um, you know, or is this is relatively new and you're reacting to this vessel that just happened to be in your local um, waterway. Um, so that's really um, a couple of the highlights there. Um, Rhode Island is, is unique. It's again, um, a, a state sort of top down process, but they have a very unique structure in which they have a commission um, that is made up of NGOs, um, state uh, agencies, sort of policy staff and the law enforcement. Um, side, and they also have um, Harbor Masters, um, I believe I said the, the NGO, I believe it's the Nar Save Narragansett Bay. So they've got a very balanced group of stakeholders that uh, since 2012, I believe, has been working on and whittling down the ADVs in the state. And it wasn't initially a big problem. They've got it down to very manageable half dozen or so. Um, but that also is limited by uh, with kind of a caveat of um, those being on state waters, um, state bottom, or on state-owned lands. Um, so there is a, a little bit of a, a, a gap in what, what they would normally do. They would ask a locality or a harbor master to submit an application. They make sure it's really um, dotting their I's, crossing their T's, and they present that to the commission. Law enforcement will do that as staff, and then the commission will vote, and usually they will get it approved because of that front-loaded effort to, to make it perfect. Um, and then they will, um, you know, get the funding from the state um, that is uh, created from a voter registration fee. So fee informs exclusively for the ADB program. They've not had any issues with Coast Guard funding, um, but then they will go pay for that um, the locality. Locality, but it's sort of the democratic uh, process. They also have a ranking matrix, which I can share later. But we're going to use that some of the weights and the criteria for prioritizing. Our own vessel removal fund inventory um, that I'm working on. So that's interesting, um, but there is a little bit of um, some of these lessons learned. If you have a boat in a marina that is on private property and they've had incidents where the marina uh, owner does not want to remove it because the state is not going to reimburse them for that removal because it's out of their jurisdiction. So that vessel gets, um, let's just say, gets loose in the middle of the night and then drifts into a public um, navigation channel. And then now the state, they're able to basically get the state to remove it through the same application process, but they're not the applicant. It's, a, it's the state funding um, uh, and maybe the harbor master. So that's sort of an interesting, some, some pros, some cons. It seemed to be one of the better run uh, programs. And, and just keep in mind that commission as we get into the funding source, um, is this one year, is this 10 years? Um, what do we do with surplus funds? How do we ensure that they're not returned to the General Assembly, but that they're managed uh, wisely and fairly and transparently. Um, so having a commission um, made up of many stakeholders versus just creating one, um, putting it in one agency silo is something to, to keep in mind. Um, but that was sort of the big aha moment with Rhode Island. Um, 
So then Ohio was was probably the most quirky of them in the sense that they, um, you know, they are still working through some new registration titling laws. They are very comprehensive and they will make you do title registration for all these non-motorized watercraft under a certain amount uh, of length and size, um, but they they don't really require the title, but they also require the registration for kayaks and canoe um, and paddle boards. So it's kind of down to this, they've got a tab on every vessel that you can call a vessel, um, but they there is some gaps in the tracking. There's a lot of trust, um, especially being on the Great Lakes with so many other uh, states bordering um, that area. And what do you do if you, if you get another vessel um, and how do you communicate? So it is basically one or two full-time staff who are tracking down these vessels working with the Coast Guard um, perhaps more closely than with Sector Virginia, and then the Coast Guard will go right out there and, and tow it away. There might be more resources in that region, in that division, but um, it is really um, the state leads the uh, sort of the, the detective effort. Um, Coast Guard removes emergency vessels, um, no problem. And then um, they will work with any individual, private or public, to say, I want the title of this vessel after basically exhausting all the options, they say, well, can't find the last owner. We've notified them if we had. And if there's no response after a, a short time period, they will then say, okay, you know, Joe, um, John Doe, um, here it is, here's the title and you go ahead and remove it. So um, funding is, is sort of a, uh, an enigma in that sense that are, they're putting the liability and the cost on uh, individuals or local governments um, without a sort of formal application as we've discussed in, in previous states. So. Hopefully that wasn't too long-winded um, and really hit the high points of funding. Um, any questions on that, folks? Well, I guess I just have a point, um, I guess for Katie, a question or maybe a point. The vessel turn-in program in California, a voluntary turn-in program, was that working out well for them? I think you're on mute, Katie. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Katie, you might be on mute here. Thank you. There I okay. am. So, yes, okay. um, they seem to be very positive about that program. Uh, they, they have done the math and they figured out, as I mentioned earlier, that the great financial savings from mm -hmm. a voluntary turn-in on a boat that has a title and no mechanical liens or any other, you know, liens on the boat. Um, they do that through contractual agreements with certain marinas um, and that list of marinas is published. And uh, so if you have a derelict boat, you learn about this program, you go to one of the marinas in the program and then the state will reimburse the marina for the cost of you know, getting it out, getting it on a trailer. Um, so yeah, they, they were really, pretty happy with that program, but it didn't happen year one with their program. It, it was something that they built into. And I believe the same Oregon is looking at something like this too. Um, and I, I wanted to mention a, a few other thoughts. So as um, Jeff just outlined, there's different sourcing of income or for funding for these programs. Um, there was discussion last week during the law and policy subcommittee about what happens if after we if we start a program and if it's funded by a fee that's paid by boaters uh, and after we get through the backlog of what we've got what 170 vessels that are identified already what if we end up with a surplus and will that surplus look attractive to be rated but we did hear from one state that they have a bit of a surplus, but one hurricane will wipe it out. So um, we also heard <clears throat> from a state that the spending of the funds are done with approval of a, a committee, a council, a um, commission that's made up of uh, an assortment of local law enforcement, local governments, state agencies, voters, um, because there's some nuance, like um, somebody said, oh, I've got this floating dock that's become unmoored and I want to spend this ADV funding to get rid of this floating dock, which is derelict. 
And so this commission had to weigh, is this an appropriate expense or not? Um, so I, I thought that was probably a, a, an interesting model. Um, a lot of these that programs also, pardon? That was Rhode Island, both of those points, the uh, hurricane right. and the uh, commission. Okay. Um, we also saw a lot of states that work very closely with local governments, or in the case of California, they work closely with marinas. Uh, California also works with marinas to strengthen the documentation they get from boaters so that if a boat is abandoned at a marina, the um, marina owners have lots of documentation on you know, who owns the boat, what bank uh, liens are on the boat, things like that. Um, on that so point, I also like, uh, I think uh, Florida does it where they I don't know if you go to that, Jeff, where Florida yep. does it where they tie, they, they make the owner responsible for the transfer of title to, because that seems to be a problem in Virginia, where the, and so that makes it hard for DWR to track down the last owner. So if we could strengthen that, that'd be a good yeah, idea. That, that is a big point. Very good. That, that is a big point that um, somebody sells an old vessel, the new person never registers it. And so the, the last known owner is, is liable. So yeah, that's definitely been brought up a lot. Um, and let me just see what other notes I had. Um, and Florida also has some criminal penalties for abandonment and they attach it to, I think even the driver's license. I don't know if we're considering that at all or what do we think about that? I, I don't know. That, that though might be a better question for the policy okay. and um, law subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's all related. These, these two committees, their work is definitely overlapping. Uh, so those are the only points I wanted to, to make that there's multiple sources of possible funding. We all recognize that we can't have a registration fee that interferes in any way with the Coast Guard's recreational safety grant that they give to the state of Virginia. Um, and that is the conversation Jeff mentioned earlier. He and I will be meeting with three people at the NOAA Marine Debris Program, either later this week or next week. And we're going to talk to them, NOAA, about going to the Coast Guard to better understand what are the expectations for that Coast Guard grant. And what language would they be okay with? Because this is coming up in, in all of the states, not just Virginia. Um, you know, how do you have an ADV fee that is clearly not going to get in the way of the of the Coast Guard grants to states? Um, so that's something that we're thinking that NOAA on a national level can talk to the Coast Guard on a national level to clarify that for everybody, not just Virginia. When you have that meeting with Noah, are you also asking him about the um, the grant that we're going to try to uh, apply for in the summertime, and how yeah, we can get uh, that? If we have any questions about that, uh, that would probably be an appropriate thing to add to our agenda. Um, so the grant that Neil is referring to is once a year, the NOAA Marine Debris Program has a grant for uh, removal of marine debris and removal of derelict vessels has been funded through that grant program. Uh, so we are, you know, hoping, I, just short of planning, I mean, that we, um, we, we have to discuss if Virginia were to go for that grant, what would we um, ask for? You know, what, how much money would we ask for? What would we propose to fund with the grant? And who would be the lead agency to do the fiscal administration and all the um, coordination and all the reporting that a federal grant brings up. So yeah, if, if we have some more specific questions, that would be appropriate to talk to them. Yeah, I think we should pursue that. Sounds like a good source of funding. Yeah, you know, we, we, we might have to have a separate little subcommittee of people who are interested in that uh, and, you know, start talking it, about it over the next few weeks because usually once they announce that the grant is open, a letter of inquiry, two pages, you, you don't have to go into a lot of detail, uh, is usually due within five or six weeks. Uh, so it would be appropriate for us to start uh, thinking about, you know, if we were to ask for $100,000, let's say, what program would we pursue? 
and how would we get the match? The match required is one to one. So if we got a hundred thousand from the NOAA grant, we'd have to match it. So um, yeah, I think that's probably appropriate that we have a, a separate committee of people who are interested in that. Thank you. Yep, and to add on to that, I mean, this is the last agenda um, bullet point actually, but um, you know, because of the prep work going into the overall uh, work group meeting and, and getting some, some sort of deliverables to kind of for y'all to view, um, we're thinking about doing the next um, set of, except for the ones that are already in the book scheduled, um, you know, removals tomorrow, um, but to have the next round of subcommittee meetings in June. Um, so we might have time in May between then and the next policy and funding and removal subcommittee in June to have that smaller group get together just on the specific grant. We might be able to have a mini meeting in that. Um, and certainly we'll, we'll pull all the resources that Noah shared with us and, and you know, boil it down to a very succinct list of questions for them at that um, meeting at the Coast Guard. Also um, by skipping a lot of meetings in the month of May, it will give Jeff and I time to work with uh, Coastal's management program or the Coastal Policy um, Center with the white paper and um, get that report um, if we need to augment it with a summary of our committee work, things like that. So that will give Jeff and I more time to work on that project. And, and one more thing, um, you know, because this is just going to be a meeting with NOAA, um, sort of to get their summary take on what's, de what's the development with the Coast Guard and these other states. But I think, not to put you on the spot, Jesse, but I, I think you had indicated on Friday's meeting that you might be reaching out to the Coast Guard or to work, reaching out to DWR's um, legal team to figure out like the, the trigger language that they ran into issues with, with the Coast Guard. Is that, is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. Um, in Friday's meeting, I thought I, that you had said that you were going to reach out to DWR's legal team or, or staff attorney to talk about um, like the problem they had exactly with the Coast Guard uh, with their fee and the Coast Guard grant, and then what um, what the name of their um, registration fee is, um, just to kind of make sure we're getting the, the right title for that. And yeah, I mean, it would be great to hear the story behind what happened, because all I've yeah. seen are emails that say, don't do this, it might be a problem, don't do this, it might run afoul of U.S. Coast Guard funding. Um, so I don't know the story, and I assume Elizabeth would be probably the person to ask nope. So I could, I'll, I'll definitely mention it to her. I, um, I think I was kind of opining that I wish we, <laughs> I wish we had someone gotcha. from, from the legal um, team that, that advised of this because I haven't seen why it's an issue. Um, but yeah, that's something that if we, if we, if we don't know why that's necessarily a problem, I want to find out from someone and I'm sure Elizabeth has some sort of contacts at the state level that we could reach out to and, and look into. I think um, Anthony's wrapping up his paper, hopefully this week or next. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be something that we can hopefully put into the paper if we get um, some clarification before it's finalized. Awesome. Jesse, I think, I think you might want to speak to Tom Guest might have some insight into that. Would yeah, he's some... been on a few of these calls and I haven't gotten much feedback about his perspective he just seems very hardline about but without any reason but obviously he's not an attorney so i'm, I'm i would be curious but he, he hasn't given me much candid feedback of why he thinks that it's an issue beyond did, he thinks it's an issue did i share with you his long response to lieutenant commander pete francisco um, i believe anthony has that anthony do you have that Anthony, if he's with us, he's on a phone. Oh yeah, maybe he didn't. Maybe he's not with us. I thought someone said he joined, but yeah. So I that is where I I heard that, and I I don't have that. Um, so that'd be great if you could send that to me, Katie. Okay. I'll, but I'll I do remember Anthony saying that it just seemed like he was saying, "Oh, like be cautious, be cautious." Pretty much. Um, <laughs> pretty much. That's what he's saying. So that's why Jeff and I think this needs to be clarified and 
rather than Virginia do it with the Coast Guard, why doesn't NOAA do it on behalf of the entire United States? Because uh, like I say, this has come up with other conversations. And um, so we just need to know the language that will make the Coast Guard happy that their regulation will be um, followed, that registration fees can't be tacked on to basically. So I, I don't know why it just can't be called a separate fee that's collected at the same time, but I'm not a lawyer either. So. Does the Coast yeah, Guard, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, does the Coast Guard gentleman have any input on that? Uh, the, I'll Thanks. send that to everybody. Basically, Commander, Lieutenant Commander Francisco did talk to somebody at the Coast Guard who's part of that grant program um it's it's a long email chain and there's it's not like a clear one sentence that answers our questions i guess is what i'm getting at which is why i'm hoping that the NOAA marine debris program could get that one paragraph clear language that will let us know what's permitted but i'll i'll go ahead and send that to everybody on this call that yeah, chain I did, I did get some uh what you sent back after the last meeting i have it on my phone what you what you sent? Well, I'll send it to everybody on this call too. So. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions on how other states are managing to fund their programs? Uh, real quick, this is uh, this is Petty Officer Leatherman again, just chiming in. Um, so I, this is this is fairly new ground for me to to cover as far as registration fees and that kind of thing. You're concerned. Uh, um, thank you for sending that. Uh, information out to us after this meeting. Uh, I'm taking copious notes right now. Uh, what I'll be doing is is taking all of all of what we're talking about back, uh, so I can share it with my command, and maybe we might be able to provide some more insight at the next meeting um, as to some of these subjects here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, why don't we move to the next agenda item? Um, and if you could share your screen, Jeff, to show that agenda. And I should say that Anthony tried like five or six times to get in and never was able to. We do have somebody who's called in on a uh, phone number that is from a 619 area code. Yeah, that's I San Diego. I think that is Anthony. So, okay. so he's I don't listening. know if he can't hear me when I'm saying things. All right, so um, we've gone through the summary of other states. We do, Jeff, is there anything else you wanted to talk about the methods of funding um, before we talk about the a draft budget? You're on mute, Jeff. I'll say it uh, now before I forget. I mean, although I could probably bring it up later. Um, we did have some really great notes from uh, folks here, you know, Neil and Jesse from the last meeting, and then uh, Terry Hill, who's with Potomac Towing. Um, and this, this pertains um, to what Katie's going to share with the budget that um, the cost estimate for removal looked pretty good based on his, um, uh, his experience as a tower. Um, but then there was sort of another, I guess, why I'm saying it now is as a threshold issue, the policy subcommittee, and specifically Terry thought that it might be a little difficult to manage a fund that had more diverse uses beyond ADV, for instance, like hydrilla removal um, or just overall water quality, um, harmful algal blooms, that sort of thing. And the idea behind that was to make it, um, you know, more equitable for boaters who were not necessarily in the coastal zone um, to benefit from um, sort of this user fee of, of all boaters paying into the registration fee as proposed. But um, that was just something I didn't want to, to lose track of that we made a a little traction on that kind of answer that question, but I still want, um, whether it's now or later in the discussion for this subcommittee to, to weigh in on, on what they thought about that. It just seemed to be a, a lot of things to manage and transparency might be an issue and different agencies have jurisdictions um, to address each of those things. You know, you might get DEQ involved in some of the water quality stuff um, and it just would be see too many hands in the cookie jar, so to speak, but that was all. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. All right, well, uh, I'll go ahead and share my budget. If you could stop sharing, please. Yep. Um, let me pull this up. So what 
Jeff and I did was we created a very, very, very rough budget, uh, assuming that we, we made the assumption that we're going to be pursuing um, a fee on recreational boaters, one that of course will be in compliance with uh, the Coast Guard's rules about their annual grant. Um, so we learned from the um, Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources that there's between 230 and 240 registered recreational vessels in the state of Virginia. So our little budget here shows uh, three or 235,000. Um, if there were an annual fee of $2 per boat, that would end up with an income of $470,000. Uh, if somebody were re reviewing or renewing their registration for a three year period, they would pay a total of $6 over a three year period. If the annual fee were $4, then that would generate almost a million dollars a year. And that would be $12 for anyone who's renewing over um, a three year period. And then of course, if the fee were $6, that would generate 1.4 million. Um, do we want to stop and talk about the annual fees? I mean, what do you all think of an annual fee of $2 per boat or $4 per boat or $6 per, per boat? And this would be recreational only. Any thoughts, concerns? Okay, well, then go ahead. I was just going to say, I guess we try to got to, we got to get a handle on how much it's going to cost to get rid of some of these vessels. Right. Well, let's go down to the expenses. Um, for the sake of this budget, we assumed the $4 per year fee, which would generate, as you see there on the bottom, 940000 from what we learned from other states, these programs need a manager. They need somebody to um, work with the local governments on removal reimbursement or work with marinas on programs, work on uh, the education aspects of this. So we made an assumption of $100,000 a year for this would be salary plus benefits plus other expenses that come with hiring somebody like a computer. So this would, probably end up being a salary in the, the 50s um, because benefits are usually in the 40 percentile. Um, we then, let's go down to the biggest ticket item, which is to Neil's point, the actual cost of removal and disposal. Um, with this budget that we've mocked up, there would be $695,000 a year for removal and disposal. Uh, some of this could be reimbursements to local governments and or possibly larger grants to PDCs. PDCs are um, planning district commissions and PDCs often um, cover a geographic area of multiple counties. And so we're thinking that if a PDC um, on the Northern Neck, um, for example, might have identified eight vessels. It might be best to work uh, directly with that PDC to take care of those eight rather than four in one county, four in another county. So it's a possibility. Um, so if we did have $695,000 in year one from this funding source, that would remove about 45 vessels at an average cost of 15,000. And this, these numbers were developed based on input we got from towers who indicated that $300 per foot on a boat is a reasonable ball, ballpark estimate. We have heard that some boat removals are three and 4,000, I'm sorry, removal and disposal. Uh, we've heard that some smaller boats that are not sunk can be removed and disposed of in the three to $5,000 range. But once you get into something that's sunk, we're talking perhaps 30 or 40,000. So at any rate, the feedback we got from some companies that actually do removal and disposal, uh, they thought these estimates were ballpark. Um, 
So to Neil's question, by this budget model in year one, 45 vessels approximately could be removed from the standing stock that we've got of over 100 and what is it, uh, Jeff, about 170 on the inventory? Um, just to, to give the benefit um, for Officer Leatherman here, the we received from the Coast Guard a spreadsheet of 170 vessels from 2013. We don't know, we have not verified yet whether some of them can be removed from the list. Um, and, and then yeah, this is their internal informal list um, to prevent a search and rescue from being triggered because they've already documented that this is an ADV. Um, so when we, we've also sent a Google form survey that um, folks have gotten back to me and added about 15 vessels um, to that. So doing the quick math, that's 185, but I think if you could um, somewhere within that range and the 45, obviously that, that'd be a quarter um, of 180 vessels. So you'd get about a, a quarter of them done the first year in addition to all these other costs. Um, right. And Jeff, those are just recreational vessels? We're not um, addressing the commercial vessels? I think they are both. Uh, I have to, to double check that. Um, I think because there are a lot of them in the coastal zone um, mm -hmm. that they would tend to include um, commercial. I'm, I'm almost positive it includes commercial. I think there was one trawler I saw there, one of the on the top row um, last time I looked at it. And we know that um, there's been efforts for years to get rid of a half sunken barred mm -hmm. Um, yep. that's estimated to be $100,000 to remove and dispose of. So, um, yeah, so I guess by kind of default, we're only talking about recreational vessels at, at, for, for the sake of this budget. Um, how, but would we, it, yeah, how would we address the commercial vessels then? We, we wouldn't take any money from a recreational, like registration fee or whatever we decide on to put it towards removal of commercial vessels? Yeah. More costly, obviously. Well, it's just not a matter of cost. It's also a matter of uh, registration, and you know, commercial vessels often uh, move around a whole lot more than recreational. Uh, it's it's a different beast, uh, I guess, is what we've learned from other states. And other states seem to also be separating their recreational ADV issues from from commercial uh, for many reasons. Would you say, Jeff, that's a fair summary? Yep. I would say that it's it's not as, they're not as numerous, obviously, that, you know, even though it's harder to kind of pin down who's responsible because of the vessel's international or its flag here and its port of call is here. I mean, there's, I believe there's like three different criteria that it can, can fall under if it's international um, vessel. So I would want to look at, um, you know, even though it's harder to pin who's the responsible owner, it's also, I guess, harder to abandon. I know that sounds a little bit um, casual to say, but it just, you see more abandoned sailboats than you see large shrimp trawlers. Um, so in order to close the loop on that, I would want to look at VMRC's um, criteria for, you know, if you have a fishing license, if you have a commercial captain's license, and how that is tied to um, vessel registration for a commercial fishing vessel. Um, that would be something for me to follow up on. I think a whole different conversation. Um, it reminds me too of two things that I learned when I was speaking to the California program manager. Uh, he said, first of all, be very careful with terminology in any laws or policies or grants or funding opportunities. Originally, they used the word marine debris. They said, we're going to create a fund to deal with marine debris. Yeah. And they were thinking marine debris is abandoned vessels, but marine debris can include all kinds of things. Uh, and he said, as soon as they started their program, they got requests to remove cars, cars that had been driven into the water because they were marine debris. Uh, they got calls for uh, docks that had, that had wandered um, and a shipping container that had fallen off of a of a ship out at sea had washed up on a beach. So he did say, be very careful in your terminology. Uh, he also said, really define what we mean by recreational because they had one case where somebody had a shrimping, shrimp trawler that was derelict. They 
sold it to someone who said they were going to use it for recreational purposes and then they tried to get funding from the ADV recreational funding to remove it and it was going to be you know monstrously expensive because it was so their definition of recreational includes language that uh, something like what was the original intent of the vessel you know was it originally a military <laughs> uh, ship that can't be reclassified as recreational just to get this funding um, so two other things that just popped in my mind which probably would be good for the white paper <laughs> yeah i guess um oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. i was just going to say i guess i think we brought this point up last meeting too that the responsibility with the white paper we're going to say falls on the owner the vessel owner primarily before you know it's not a get out of jail free card with any kind of funding we have so we should notate that somewhere. Absolutely. Finalize a finalize paper. Yeah, and and every state we talk to agrees that the responsibility for ADVs falls on the owner. It's just when the owner really can't be found, or when somebody does have proof that they sold the vessel, it uh, they just can't remember to whom and whomever bought it never uh, registered it. So, yes, they they do try to get reimbursed by the responsible party for any removal and disposal costs when possible. But when somebody's dead and or broke, you know, has no money, then that's where this fund kicks in. I think Virginia has some problems with out-of-state people too, that uh, if it's a band of vessel in Smith Mount Lake and they try to find somebody in, their, in a different state, it makes it harder to, uh, you know, hold right. them accountable. Which is why I, I, I like very much the model of having a council or a commission to answer these questions as they come up, uh, especially um, like Bugs uh, Lake, which is partly in Virginia, partly in North Carolina. Um, I've heard that there's lots of people who live in Cor North Carolina, but they keep their boat in Virginia because it's advantageous to them. Um, so right, it's there's gonna be lots of things like that. Um, but let's go back and look at the budget a little bit. Um, we had $8,000 for education and we thought this would be, for example, going to uh, boating festivals where lots of boaters would be gathering, um, having information about their responsibilities. So this would cover <clears throat> that kind of uh, community engagement expenses. Um, if we want to start an at-risk program like they have in Florida, where law enforcement, when they see a boat that is starting to show the signs of um, uh, becoming derelict, they can have a conversation and let boaters uh, know about opportunities to turn in boats. Um, so that's a possibility. The admin expenses, most of the time when a state agency uh, does the fiscal management for a fund, they take a chunk of the fund for that fiscal management where we just guessed 5% because we know of one other uh, fund that's managed by a state agency and they take 5%, but that number, I don't really know if that's uh, what um, the Department of Wildlife Resources would require. And that's another assumption. Would these funds be managed by uh, DWR or not? Um, uh, one other thing we did hear from other states is it's best to have one state agency that has law enforcement capabilities to run the program. I think it was North Carolina said originally they had authority split between multiple agencies, kind of like we have in Virginia, um, and they condensed it into one, uh, which made it easier for them to, to stay on top of everything. Mm -hmm. So I'll be quiet and ask for any comments at all on the on this <laughs> proposed thought. Just another point. It sounds like we need to get DWR on some of these meetings and maybe some, you know, some people more from the Coast Guard that can tell us certain things too, you know, because we're kind of just guessing right now. And if you want to streamline, you know, on a commission. We really need to get them involved. I don't know if we do it before the paper comes out or after the paper comes out, but we got to try to get some of them. Yeah. Meetings. 
that's that's a really good point. Um, and they have attended some of the early meetings. And I know Tom Guess sent me an email last week saying that he's now doing two jobs, his own and uh, somebody else's. So he's swamped. Um, but as far as timing, my guess is the, the white paper is going to be out before we can have some of these in-depth conversations. It's also awkward that the VMRC, uh, which also shares authority for ADVs in Virginia, um, Ken or Tony Watkinson just retired and he has been running this program for decades. So um, there's a transition there going on. So it's uh, not the best timing perhaps, but I agree. We have to have them seriously at the table. When we come up with the white paper, do they, does it get sent to these um, departments and VMRC, for instance, and DWR? For That's them to look at it. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me just see what other questions we had. Um, these are questions Jeff and I came up with. Uh, let's see, we need more detailed breakdown, actual removal. Actually, we, we took care of that. This question here, um, we wanted to make sure that our estimates were ballpark correct and we've learned that they are. Um, question, sh oh yeah, should local government's time be reimbursed? Um, this was an issue we also heard. So several states have a program where let's say you're the, the mayor of a, a town or you're a board of supervisors for a county and you want to take care of a boat removal, uh, a derelict boat, you, the county, the, the government needs to try to find the last known owner, reach out to them, do the, um, the letters to the person, all that stuff. After they realize that they can't find the owner, there's a form they can fill out saying, we would like to be reimbursed for the removal and disposal of this ADV. We've already gone through you know, the search for the, the last known owner. Um, and then if it's approved, the boat can be removed and then the county is reimbursed for those expenses. One local government did the process and they added several hundred dollars on for their time, the time it took them to do the title search and all that. And in that particular state, the, the committee said, no, this is not appropriate uses of our funds. We reimburse actual expenses, not the time it takes. But that is a question that would probably come up with a Virginia fund. Um, and then there's the question, should we consider a council or a commission or something of diverse membership to oversee the funds? And if the fund grows, this is a comment that came up last week, last week, if the fund does grow, you know, like maybe not year one or two or three, when we're dealing with the backlog and legacy issues, um, and it ends up having excess, how do we make sure that it stays in waterway improvements and not get siphoned off to a general fund? And that's where the point comes in that one hurricane can really cause uh, a great need for funding. Um, let me see if there's any other. Another thought would be down the road, do we want to consider a voluntary turn-in program? But based on what we heard from other states, that's not what you start with. You know, you start with the backlog. So any thoughts or next steps, perhaps? Well, Katie, um... Would it be helpful to put like the specifics about uh, the, you know, how much you might charge when, if you impose these types of fees into the paper or should we leave it kind of just, this is a approach, but we don't have to get into those specifics. I'm curious about that. So for yeah. instance, the $2, the $6 or the $4, like we could, we could say like, and this would, you know, maybe even just in a footnote say like, this is how much money we would get from if we did it this way as, as opposed to this other way. I would think it'd be appropriate to put it in the white paper. Okay. Um, and, and I think what we've always thought is that uh, Jeff and I will probably write a, a shorter summary of, uh, or it might be in, you know, in your summary. I don't know, I haven't seen the, the paper, obviously, your white paper, but um, at some point, I think people are gonna to wanna to see, here are the top 10 recommendations that have come out of this year of 
you working on the policy paper and all these committees working and talking. Um, but yeah, I think that that would be appropriate if you think that's appropriate. If not, you could be vague and say, you know, one avenue that's tried by other states that has successfully raised funds is an annual fee on top of the registration fees or not to be confused with <laughs> the registration fees. So I could send you this document if you would like. Yeah, that's why I wanted to, to bring it up because so you showed this at the last meeting as well. And I, I don't have these specifics, so we wouldn't, you know, it'd be great if you could send them to Anthony um, and myself. Sure. And um, Anthony is on the call. He said he can't talk, but he can hear everything. Um, so he's listening in. But uh, yeah, if, and, and there was something else I wanted to say for Friday, um, our meeting we're having then to discuss the paper. A anyway, I had a question about something unrelated about the um, commercial versus re recreational, but I can save it for later. Okay, yeah, it's something we definitely need to talk about. <laughs> we started this uh, in January saying, should we talk about both? And as the committees have evolved, we've ended up focusing on what seems to be the bigger and almost easier problem, which is recreational. All right, other comments, thoughts? Do the people on this call all endorse pursuing the thought of an annual fee for recreational boaters to fund an ADV program? I see one thumbs up, one nodding, two nodding. I would say yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I guess if we did do the um, added fee, and we said if it was for recreational vessels and it was used for commercial also if we had an excess fund maybe we could go to commercial vessel removal would people have a problem with that you know if they're just putting in a fee for a recreational a vessel and if some of it going towards a commercial you know just a thought i mean could well be <laughs> but i think if we ever did get to that point we had excess funds and it was okay to use we could maybe try to tackle some commercial vessels too, you know, because you said- it's, it's definitely interesting to hear from Katie that the states have been um, hesitant to uh, work on the commercial uh, vessels. And I think it makes sense though, when you consider that probably people, a lot of people do consider it like a corporate handout. Also, um, the, whole, <laughs> the whole reason we have uh, RICRA laws and circular laws, super fun laws, and hazardous site laws is because corporations have found ways to get around and to um, recycle things that are actually not being recycled and to dispose of things um, irresponsibly. So I'm not surprised to hear there's a hesitancy to kind of lump them in because the recreational, it's an issue. And, you know, you might have one boat in your lifetime. It might end up, uh, you know, an ADV but this is the backstop to make sure that it's not an issue that um, the state can't handle. So there's, there's just different considerations for the commercial. But as far as your question about whether, okay, yeah, we've taken care of the backlog, uh, legally speaking, um, it will be more challenging to craft uh, a law that says, you know, we, we can use it for recreational, but then if there's a X amount of money, then we can pursue these commercial um, ADVs. So I would just say that, and this is what we've heard as far as like making sure we stick to it, stick to just the ADVs for the fun, because if we say we, it's also to, um, you know, remove invasive species like hedrilla or something like that, then there's going to be people who are trying to find a way just to have it spent on that. Sure. Um, but it needs to be this kind of, like I said, a backstop, like a, and if a hurricane comes through, there's going to, it's going to be a bigger issue. If we get rid of some of the backlog, it might seem like a smaller issue. But in crafting the law, um, yeah, we'll have to think about whether we want the funds to revert into the general fund. And we've heard we heard from someone at the last meeting that we should design it so it does not do that. So we do kind of keep this rainy day fund, hurricane fund, whatever you want to call it, where um, it the money stays there and does not just revert. But yeah, as far as like crafting it, it's just simpler to say this fund is for this specific thing and, and to make it broader will be more complicated and it could be... Um, it could just be harder to have the funds go to where we want them to go. Uh, so that, so that's just my two cents on that. No, and I that, agree with you. Go ahead, I, go ahead Katie. Ladies first. 
um, that that mirrors what we heard in California. Keep it very well defined. Um, <clears throat> one person last week did bring up that there already is an existing list of waterway safety issues. Um, so I, I guess the thought is if the uses of this fund can expand in the future, it be to already things that would help uh, uh, to, to items that are already defined as waterway safety issues that would help the recreational boaters. But um, yeah, I think keeping it really simple and well-defined at least until we get through the backlog. Um, if we get a surplus in a few years, deal with that then. And we have Terry who just joined us um, from a tow company in, was it Lake Anna or Potomac? No, I'm uh, Potomac River. Up in yeah, Potomac. great, great. So, so, so far, Terry, we've gone over a lot of what you heard last week as far as um, what other states have done to raise funds and we took a look at this possible annual fee possible budget and um just i guess looking for feedback and any recommendations this funding committee wants to make since the policy paper is going to be finished in the next few weeks and uh it sounds like we are going to ask that this possible chart of fees be added to the white paper um and i'll send you this expense breakdown too if if you guys want to put that in as well. That makes the most sense to me in terms of trying to find a way to fund it. It's if it needs to be on the backs of the boaters and you know evenly spread and make it work. I, I think it's the most logical way to do it. It's just a matter of the the process and trying to get it in, in whether it's involved in registration timing or however you go about doing it. You know, a sticker, whatever it's going, whatever it costs or it takes, but before we go. Right. And that's something we have to learn about too, is how other states have sticker programs or decal programs. Um, you know, how do they administer it and what's the cost of administering it and all that stuff. And yeah, there's, they used to have a use tax um, and it's, it was really taken badly by all the boaters. They hated it. It was a, it was a, it was a federal expense that was an addition to your boat registration, but um, you make it a, waterway, you know, you, whatever you want to call it, make it, make it something that sounds really good to them. Uh, you're not trying to lie to them, but it's, it's not saying it's a disposal or abandoned vessel uh, fund. It's a, it's a waterways improvement fund, but you got to be careful. Like I said, when you put it back to legislatures, you got to be careful with the legislatures, what you're, how you're selling it to them and what they think that's for and what they want it to be for. If, if they have to approve it, I, who would have to approve that fee? Jesse, would that be part of a law? Yeah, it'd be legislatively. Legislative. Um, yeah. So Florida, well, it, uh, Virginia legislature. And actually that's a point that Tom Guest made in his emails, the emails that I will send to all of you is his concern is a really well-crafted bill with careful language can get messed up in subcommittees and you know it's possible for a, what starts out to be a good idea ends up being poorly uh, executed so i that will have to um be careful about i've seen that happen too where if somebody slips in a word and all of a sudden an unintended consequence or a loophole is is created so i've seen that too so we got lucky in the in the um Funding for dredging in the state of Virginia, we were we managed to get that through, and it was a big, big hot potato in Richmond and, and down in the southern areas. Most of you guys might have been involved in that to some degree. Um, a couple of legislatures were big on it, but we had a, a couple of our folks up here. Scott Serval was one, and um, uh, the other I can't remember his name, but he was on the uh, finance committee, so he was one of the people to actually. Put this forward and also make sure it stayed crafted right we've got some allies on this end of the of the state that um and i know we have some down south it's just a matter of getting those people together giving them i find it's easier to give them the language and and let them carry it through than it is to let them craft the language so i think that's what your white paper is basically going to do it when the end of that i would i would hope we come out with this is the language we would like you to use and they will take that ball and run with it
Yeah, like we, Terry, that we, sounds familiar with um, one of our grantees with Middle Peninsula PDC, Louis Lawrence, um, is a great, great asset um, and partner with our CZM program. And his delegate is Keith Hodges. Um, so I think um, I think those two were working on something. I know we funded at least a study to kind of look into policy outcomes for um, dredging some of those channels the Army Corps had, had just kind of abandoned for lack of funding. Um, so he's, they're pretty good at crafting legislation pretty quick, very detailed and um, getting, you know, some bipartisan backing for that. We also have some political allies in uh, Tidewater area. Um, in fact, there's a, a lawyer who's been engaged a little bit with our work and he's raring to go to get politicians involved. And we're like, not yet, <laughs> let's, let's define the problem exactly and then get them engaged. I think you have to be careful about that waterways improvement um, part there because that could be used for a lot of other things in ADVs. I know you want to make it sound good to the public and not lie to them, which we can't, um, but it really should be a little bit more specific for ADVs, in my opinion. Okay, I, I don't disagree with that. I just, uh, it's just a thought, but either way we do it, we need to craft that language and, and have the basically the bill drawn up for them and handed to them. Right. And as I understand it, uh, Jesse, that the, um, the white paper you're doing will not include specific recommended language, but instead a specific recommended list of things a good bill should have. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there's a fine line between lobbying and, and just saying what's out there and kind of giving a, you know, what our research has turned up. So we, and, and I mean, I, I think when I first started on this project, I, I was hoping maybe we could do like a model ordinance, um, but that's just beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. But that, I mean, that would be great um, if someone could do that. I, I mean, we talked about having maybe an organization that, that does have a lobbying arm um, take this forward and, and work on something like that. And like I said, I mean, that was something I was interested in doing. Um, but yeah, so our white paper is going to say like, these are the, um, the options. And then hopefully I, I envision it as being like in a prioritized list. So like funding will have at the top, like this is the best way to get it funded. And then second best, and then third best, and then fourth best. And like, you can say, you know, these could be done different ways. Um, if you did like an excise tax like Maryland does, you know, these are the drawbacks and things like that, but it'll at least be in there so that you know that it's an option. And it's that it's something that another state that uh, is, you know, close by and similar to Virginia in certain ways um, has done. Um, so yeah, it will have these, these kinds of, you know, concise policy ideas that could be taken forward and put into a uh, Virginia piece of legislation there's always, you know, that's pretty pessimistic to say, um, you know, well, it's just going to get messed up anyway by the, the politicians when they take it forward. Um, like you, like we've mentioned now, it's, it's good to have, you know, champions who are working on it and who know what, what it needs to be at the end of the day, who work on it and kind of take it um, through to the finish line. Yeah, I concur. Uh, just because it could be messed up doesn't mean, well, let's not even try. <laughs> um, uh, and that's a good point. We have a lot of nonprofit organizations on this work group that care deeply about this issue, and all of them can do advocacy. The line is who can lobby. Um, and, but yeah, that's something that once we have the recommendations, we'll deal with that. Uh, and Jessica, uh, if we could, Jessica is chairing the subcommittee on prevention and public education. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts about this? She had to step off. Oh, did she have to? Okay. okay. Yeah, about well, 15 minutes ago, I don't know the meeting, <clears throat> but she'll definitely be in the loop. I mean, that's, that's her okay. thing to do. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think somebody brought up the a critical next step is a conversation with DWR about these thoughts and um, you know who is going to 
if we're going to go with this, who is going to take in the funds and who's going to do the fiscal management and who's going to administer the program, you know, which would include perhaps the, the uh, reimbursement pro um, program to local governments. I guess most of us on the phone call have assumed DWR, um, but they need to be more part of the conversation. Should we bring uh, Virginia Marine Resources into this, VMRC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've been engaged as well. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure how that conversation would go. I mean, I it be a small group. Yeah, any thoughts on a sit down with both agencies? You said they're in transition now? Yeah, the, the, the new fellow who's okay. taken over for Tony is known and he has participated in several of our meetings. Can you call his name, Jeff? I have to look up the registration. Oh, the, this is news. I, my boss is actually, I think, part of the review panel a couple weeks ago. Is there an announcement? Oh, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe it's a short term. Um, maybe. Um, I knew that Justin Whirl was the alternate. There we but go. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I've worked with him for many years. You're right. Justin Worrell, um, and he's in habitat management. So maybe he's just keeping the seat warm, but Active not Navy. the replacement. You're right. They're, they are going through the search right now. Yeah. And we don't know. Would uh, VMRC like to see it all shift to um, wildlife resources or would they hate that? I mean, we don't know. So next steps on that might be contingent on when a new person is in that um, seat. I want to go back to the agenda. Yep. All right. So folks, I've made some edits based on some of the next steps we've identified. So don't let that scare you. The majority are for Katie and myself, um, but just to kind of give everyone the um, uh, something just to show here. Um, so really, I mean, I, I think Jesse's kind of given the, the white paper update and, you know, just been since Friday um, when we had the last comprehensive update from Anthony. One thing I, I did want to highlight for this group's benefit was that um, Anthony had, had mentioned kind of some of the research with other states um, and to the point about liability that I tend to mention a couple of times um, in our interviews with other states that, that Anthony was saying that it's in code. Now, sometimes there's a, a spectrum of detail to just vague language about um, what covers the state, but that was a concern of DWR. So that'll be something that we'll, we'll want to get our um, heads wrapped around, um, not just the Coast Guard fee issue, um, but you know their, their comfort level. And if there's anything that can point to you that says, you know, th this is why, this is what we're using, for liability, or this is the gap that we need to have some coverage through legislation to empower us to be able to take on that risk of, of putting a rope on a vessel. So um, that's really it. And anything, Jesse, you want to add? That was just more of a placeholder uh, update. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's too bad Anthony can't talk, but at, so that sounds in keeping with what. Um, we've discussed and obviously we're going to meet on Friday and hopefully hammer out a lot of the details on what we, we all want to make sure we see in the paper and what um, is, you know, we might want to leave out just for strategic reasons, or if it's just not something we feel like anyone's formed a consensus around, but yeah. So I feel like we'll have a lot more information after Friday. Okay. Cool. Um, Really, I mean, we've kind of had our open discussion, folks. Is there any updates from the group? You know, Neil or Terry, anything you you want to propose that we investigate, or or any breakthroughs on your on your end? No, I just have to find out the location of that other uh, boat that went down due to a fire. So I try to look for that. No, I have nothing. Terry, do you think you'll be able to make um, tomorrow's removal? Um, subcommittee meeting at 10? Yeah, I think so. Um, today I had to deal with a, a boat rental training, so 
I should be all right for 10 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, yep, so that's, and then you can all see that this, this next steps, I really, I won't read through them. These are just more notes, um, but to, to call everyone's attention that, uh, as I said earlier, with, um, you know, the May um, shuffle, getting a lot of things ready for the overall work group meeting um, after our, um, removal meeting tomorrow and then um, Jessica's um, prevention meeting May 6th that was already scheduled um, we're gonna we're gonna delay at the subcommittee meetings until uh, meeting again in June so we'll, we'll try to send out those Google polls and, and get those scheduled for the policy the funding and the removal ones um, and then another thought we really really want to interview Marilyn I know Anthony's done some great work in, in getting information about that uh, their, their program um, but we really want to talk to those folks because that kind of completes the loop having both neighboring states. Um, and we thought that I, I looked over again, NOAA's uh, comprehensive website for all these ADV um, that you can click on the map and they'll tell you if they have legislation, a program, funding, that sort of thing. And there's actually a really short list, um, you know, with about 35 coastal states and in inland, um, you know, uh, like Ohio and that sort of thing. Um, there's not that many that have a program. So to really close out, um, the complete interview process would be Maryland, Texas, Washington, Mississippi, um, Alabama, and then Hawaii reached out to and have not heard back from. So we'd like to get Maryland. And then I think Texas would be a great, um, you know, just a large coastline, a major city and major port, um, you know, Galveston Bay, a lot of history there. So if we could get those two, I think that would really go a long way towards informing the process. And then as I've told Neil, uh, many times we're, we're trying to get reach out to some of the inland marinas um, to get a sample from them um, on their take. Um, and then that's really then some other minor things we talked about earlier in this in this meeting. Did you get anywhere with the marinas in Smith Mountain Lake, Jeff? No, no, I'm gonna be honest, sir. It's that has been pushed until after the state the state interviews. So if we get Maryland oh. on the calendar, we'll we'll reach out to the to marinas. Jeff I did you to Maryland uh, to uh, Maine or Massachusetts or any of those up there? They they do not have, um, you know, there's there's a smattering of, oh, they have legislation, but they don't have funding and they don't have a program. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, I can, I mean, if it's, we got a couple of minutes here, if, if Katie, you want to um, mention anything else, but I can bring up their website just to show you how this, this interactive webpage works. Um, and you click on it and they say, you know, yes, no, yes. And then here's the link and a contact. And some of our really bare bones and it's it's not Noah's fault. They're just kind of processing the information. Um, but it, I was very surprised that that Massachusetts did not have a robust um, you know, program given that you know their commercial fishing history and recreational, and you would think they'd be just like Rhode Island, um, but they were surprisingly not. And, and similarly with Maine. Maine, Maine um, has some in, 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 inland waters too, with some big lakes. Yes. Lo yeah. Big lobster up there. Some, yeah, some I get that like this is Go ahead, Katie. This is a big, big issue that a lot of states have been kicking down the road. I mean, that's literally the language we've heard from North Carolina. It's, it's expensive, it's complicated, and it's been easy to kick down the road, um, and states realize they've got to come up with programs. So we're not on the, the vanguard, but we're definitely in the first set of states that uh, are having these conversations. Have you heard anything whether or not it'd be uh worthwhile to talk to Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands? Well, Katie, you know, that's Jeff? an interesting question. Um, I guess when we decided which states to look at, we tried to find ones that were somewhat comparable to us. Um, I wonder if the Virgin Islands or um, island there cultures, even Hawaii, are just so different. Um, and I, I guess, too, I'm feeling like we have heard so many similarities with the six or seven states that we've already interviewed. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that there's any other thinking outside of the boxes that we've already, uh, you know, the buckets that we've already figured out. You know, where do you get your funding? What kind of programs do you have? But if, if you all think that we could learn something from an island, um, we could do that, too. We could pursue that. Well, yeah, I mean, I was working in the Virgin Islands before here, but um, they're not too different than us. And a lot of people confuse them with us because it's VI versus VA for the um, abbreviations. 
But uh, yeah, I did find it interesting that they had laws in place there. I, I don't know anything about Puerto Rico and there might be a problem finding someone to interview in English there. Um, but yeah, I just, I wasn't sure if you had heard from Noah or anyone uh, whether, because I think Florida is obviously the one that's dealt with this the most because they've had the most hurricanes. And that's why you don't have, you know, these, these programs in Maine or a lot of the Great Lakes states. They haven't had to deal with them as much um, because less hurricanes. Yep. I, and also I put Florida the, Hey, I just put the link to what I'm sharing on my screen in the chat. So power to the people so you all can see, you know, how we've approached this. But um, to Jesse's point, you know, Puerto Rico, it's got a no, no, no for program legislation funding. Virgin Islands doesn't have a program, but they have legislation and state funding. And then Maine is a, is a no, yes, no. And then Massachusetts, um, you know, they have some of the funding, they have legislation, they have a program. So it's a little bit difficult, you know, with a, a general, you know, 1-800 type of number. Um, but that's just to kind of show you all, uh, New Jersey was another shocker, um, thinking that their proximity to New York as well here. And I think New York was the biggest surprise, given that you have Manhattan, um, all of those areas, Long Island, so much recreational yeah. boating, and that's then it. on the Great Lakes. You know, I, I, I don't know, but that's that's kind of to give you all an idea of what we're looking at. Interesting. Yeah, you know, Texas. There you go. Um, Louisiana. That was an interesting one. I thought, boy, if New Orleans doesn't have a issue in the Mississippi River with, with abandoned barges. I, I can't imagine who, who <laughs> would. Um, so. All right, well, we're uh, coming up to the end of our meeting time. Any closing thoughts, comments, or next steps you'd like to see us pursue? If not, our next meeting will be scheduled in June to be determined, but we do have uh, a meeting tomorrow with the uh, removal and um, disposal subcommittee. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make that one, so. Well, as ever, we will record and share um, on our, uh, uh, our YouTube channel. Okay, anybody else? If not, thank you, thank you so much. We were amazed at how much we've accomplished since January and it's uh, all thanks to all of you and uh, one more time, we'll say thank you to Mitchell Sherry, who has been with us as an intern, who is graduating uh, in a few weeks, and I guess this is his last funding subcommittee with us. Uh, so thanks again, Mitchell, for all your work. We, we will miss you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to end the recording and um, end the call, and thanks again. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank everybody. you.